Coming up on DTNS, I think we know what Elon Musk is up to with Twitter, plus North Dallas drone bluebell delivery and why we don't think we'll clone our pets. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, April 4th, 2022. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Let's start the show, as we always do, with a few tech things you should know. Roku's deal to distribute Amazon Prime Video and IMDb TV apps expired recently. But guess what? what? This is not a story about public recriminations and apps no longer working. The Verge noticed that Roku announced an agreement without any public campaigns or cuts in service. So, well done, Roku and Amazon, I guess. Peace in our time. Uh, the U.S. State Department announced the Cyberspace and Digital Policy Bureau, which will address the national security challenges, economic opportunities, and implications for U.S. values associated with cyberspace, digital technologies, and digital policy. The bureau will be headed by a Senate-confirmed ambassador and include three units, the International Cyberspace Security Unit, the International Information and Communications Policy Unit, and the Digital Freedom Unit. The car rental company Hertz announced it will buy 65,000 Polestar EVs over the next five years to be used in Europe, North America, and also Australia. Europe will receive the cars first this next spring, with North America and Australia getting them for rental as early as fall of 2022. So, you know, a few months away, but still some months away. In October, Hertz announced, last October rather, Hertz announced it would order 100,000 Tesla vehicles as part of its plans to electrify over 20% of its U.S. rental fleet. Google set a deadline of April 1st for apps in the Google Play Store to come into compliance with a longstanding but unenforced rule that Google Play's payment system needs to be used for in-app payments. That passed on April 1st. And now, the implications and the results are happening. The Verge notes that Barnes & Noble and Audible have both removed the ability to buy digital books in their Google Play apps. Audible will let you use credits, as it does with the iOS app, but not a credit or debit card. And new Audible memberships can be purchased and billed through Google Play. Uh, you'll also be able to buy more credits in the app. So Audible just taking away the ability to pay with a, a debit or credit card. Uh, Google and Spotify announced they will try out an alternative billing program later this year. But that, according to Barnes & Noble, uh, was not offered to it. At least that's what it told The Verge. Microsoft Chief Product Officer Panos Panay announced the Android Microsoft Platform and Experiences Unit. The company moved its teams behind its Surface Duo OS, SwiftKey, PhoneLink, Microsoft Launcher, and other Android initiatives under this new dedicated unit. Windows Central sources say that Microsoft wants to position Android smartphones as extensions of Windows PCs and create interoperable experiences between the two. All right, let's talk about Elon Musk. Let's do it. Because uh, so, <laughs> that's what he wants us to do, Sarah. So we're <laughs> going to give him his wish this time. <laughs> Indeed. Oh, gosh. So according to a filing with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, Elon Musk bought a 9.2% passive stake in Twitter on March 14th, worth about $2.9 billion. This makes Musk one of Twitter's largest shareholders and four times uh, the what uh, founder Jack Dorsey's 2.25% uh, stake includes. So uh, Musk is now a very, very large stakeholder. If you're a passive stakeholder, it means you're not on the board. You're not necessarily going to be making decisions that affect the company, but a lot of that is a little bit up in the air, depending on the company. Passive stake, that's, that's what is sort of interesting here. On March 24th, so if you're looking at a calendar, after Musk bought his stake in Twitter, because this is all public record, he posted a poll on Twitter asking whether the Twitter algorithm should be open source. That was retweeted by Jack Dorsey. The following day, that was March 25th, Musk asked the platform rigorous, if the platform rigorously adheres to free speech, then on March 26th asked if a new platform was needed. Now, at the time, because he obviously has a lot of followers, people care about what Elon Musk says, a lot of people were saying, 
Well, is he going to start his new social network? What would that look like? Blah, blah, blah. Turns out, no. Um, it is truly Twitter that now he owns a extremely large stake in. And, you know, the chatter today is, is this strategic? Is this supposed to, you know, sell more Tesla cars? Is this, is you know, is this ethical? You know, where, where are we landing on this, Tom? Yeah, I mean, the obvious analysis you're going to hear everywhere is... Uh, Elon Musk never does anything passively. So even though this investment is classified as passive, which means he doesn't get voting rights and and things like that, uh, don't expect it to stay there. I've seen like a half dozen analysts, including Dan Ives uh, of Wedbush, telling CNBC this purchase could be the first step towards a buyout. And I, and I think that's certainly possible. It doesn't guarantee that that would happen, but it certainly would be the first step if that's what he wanted to do. I think if when you look at these tweets, I've noticed that everybody talks about the March 25th one uh, and the March 26th one, talking about whether Twitter is free enough and whether there needs to be a new platform. That would seem to contradict buying a stake in Twitter. Does this mean Elon want, you know, just wants to steal Twitter's secrets and start his own? I think you have to look at that March 24th post to make these make sense. Uh, and you should have the context that Jack Dorsey has been pushing for a decentralized social networking platform led by Twitter. Uh, of course, he's no longer at Twitter, but he pushed for that for a long time. It's it's part of the project that wants to figure out how to create a decentralized way of doing Twitter. My guess is, given these three tweets, Elon Musk is investigating the idea of creating a free, like absolutist free platform that would integrate with Twitter. And he took a state in Twitter to sort of get closer to making that happen, to say, like, I want to encourage Twitter to continue to make that open source version of itself. And then I would like to launch uh, my own version that would in interoperate with Twitter, uh, because that was Dorsey's idea was you could you could have lots of different experiences of Twitter if it was open source based on what your preferences are. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's all true. What I what I think, you know, as as a just general citizen who uses Twitter quite frequently, a daily basis. Um, and Elon Musk gets a lot of inform, uh, you know, a lot of attention. You know, everything that he tweets is um, not only retweeted extensively and quote tweeted and spread far and wide, but also sort of picked apart. Like, what does it all mean? Yeah. And there's Muskology. a lot of trolling. Yeah, there's a lot of trolling stuff that go goes on from you know, that. This is my opinion, but uh, from his side, just to kind of see what gets traction it is concerning to me that uh somebody who has certainly uh extremely obvious venture benefits from having a platform like this to have so much control over a platform like this but twitter has been in flux for uh long enough especially under dorsey to kind of, you know kind of have people be like okay what's 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 going on here what's what's next here I I don't I don't want to panic yet, uh, but uh, but yeah, this is big news today. I don't think he's going to buy Twitter. I really don't. Uh, I I don't think it's impossible. He could. I yeah, I think he absolutely could. I think he absolutely considers that to be an option. Uh, you know, if I had to put a number, I'd say there's like a 19% chance that he buys Twitter. Uh, I'm not ruling out entirely, but I don't think it's really where he wants to go with this or where he'll end up. My guess is, like a lot of these things, people sometimes approach them as like, oh, so he has a plan and he's executing it. Sometimes, no. Sometimes it's, let me take step one and see what I learn now that I'm a shareholder, and then I'll decide step two. Like, he may not mm -hmm. have a, a fully formed plan, but probably has a set of options, one of which might be like trying to to do a controlling stake. But I, I think it is more likely that what we talked about uh, is where he goes, where we we see him push for some sort of open source alternative to Twitter that interoperates with it, as as again, Dorsey has has lined out as well, would be and something I don't even Twitter think would that's like. really a bad idea. I, I think there are a lot of people who'd Honestly, be no. pretty, you know, pr pr pretty down with that whole option. Um, how it uh, is executed, if it comes to fruition, is another story. But, but yeah, I, I, I think that that could have a lot of traction on its own. But it, you know, he also, Elon Musk is who I'm talking about. He says a lot of things that he's just trying to get a rise out of people. So yeah. you know. Well, a little well, bit uh, of a, you know, a little salt.
Let us know where you think it's going to go. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Alphabet's wing unit, uh, or, or business, I guess, depending on how you look at it, uh, announced it will launch its first on-demand drone delivery service in the U.S. in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, starting with Frisco and Little Elm. Those are both North Dallas suburbs. April 7th. April 7th is when you'll start to be able to get delivery from Wing in North Dallas. Now, they've done cities before. They, they've done uh, and still do Canberra, Australia. But the company claims this will be the largest metropolitan area to be served by drone delivery. Walgreens Pharmacy will be a primary launch customer. So, you know, all the health and wellness stuff they do. Uh, the drones will be staged to launch from store parking lots and Walgreens employees will load and launch the drones while the delivery will be supervised remotely by Wing employees. So Wing won't be out there loading them up. They'll, they'll train everybody to do these little, these little hangers, uh, to go in and load up the drones and, and send them on their way. In addition to Walgreens, Wing is also going to deliver products from Bluebell Creameries Easy Vet Pet Medications, and First Aid Kits from Texas Health. Uh, cargo is limited to 3.3 pounds, and the round-trip range is just about six miles. Christopher Mims of the Wall Street Journal put together a piece looking at all the different drone delivery efforts going on in the U.S. Uh, Wing is not the only one. Walmart and Zipline launched their first delivery service in Pea Ridge, Arkansas, back in November. Uh, they also deliver health and wellness products by parachute to a roughly 50 mile radius. The Israeli firm Flytrex uh, is already operating in Dallas. Uh, so they beat wing to the punch there, uh, expanding its drone based food delivery service from North Carolina last week. Uh, and they're promising five minute food delivery time in their delivery area. Uh, both these firms have completed commercial deliveries in other countries for years. Zipline completed more than 275,000 commercial deliveries in Rwanda and Ghana. We've talked about them for years on this show. Flytrex completed its first drone deliveries in Reykjavik in Iceland back in 2017. Uh, in China, Meituan operates a pilot program in seven neighborhoods in Shenzhen, saying they deliver about 19,000 meals to 8,000 customers at street side kiosks. Uh, they've been doing that since 2019. So lots of lots of drone delivery out there. Yeah, there really is. Um, the fact that I've I've never once been able to uh, figure out how to get something that I actually want to my particular house probably has a lot to do with the fact that I live in a rural area. It's not serviced yet. This is all rolling out slowly. And yes, we talk about the the promise of drone delivery, and not only the promise, but the the actual fact that drone delivery is possible and happens in various markets if it's not in your market i think it's easy to kind of go like yeah i mean is that really happening it is it 100 percent is um i would i would i would welcome this with open arms I've, I've got a neighbor who lives uh just up the street from me who's disabled and she occasionally leans on me to go get her stuff at the pharmacy and i'm happy to do so and if I'm around, I would never say no. But if I'm not, I think this is such a great option for, you know, for, not just people who, who, who can't get out of their house, but just there's so many instances where once you kind of get into certain markets of like, okay, it's not just about getting, you know, a sandwich. It's about getting something that you actually need and, and you don't have to go out and get it. And as the, as the drones are able to operate for longer and longer distances, which I assume will happen going forward, then then this gets really exciting. We're 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 getting there. I mean, zipline goes over mountains in Rwanda, uh, so rural yeah. areas can certainly be served. I feel like they're trying to solve the metropolitan area first because it's more difficult uh, with the with the crowd and it's more lucrative because yeah. you got more people. Uh, sure. But hopefully you know, once that gets solved, then they'll start being able to do economies of scale and, and deliver out to you uh, as well, Sarah. And I think that will be a huge benefit for sure. Well, if you've ever been watching a show on, let's say, cable TV, and you thought, you know, I like the show, I'd like to binge more episodes, you know, where are they? Maybe I hit the streaming service where I could binge them all at once. But you didn't know which app to use on your TV, and then you said, I'm frustrated, and you said, there's got to be a better way, and maybe <laughs> you're, you're on the Truman Show, and there's some sort of a social <laughs> experiment going on, and yes, we've all been there, okay? Vizio sure hopes that's the case because they have a solution. Late last week, the TV maker announced a beta for a new feature called Jump Ads. 
Now, this is not something as a consumer that you would need to know about, but it's something that uh, as a business owner, you would you would be very, very interested in. These will appear while watching linear TV. For most people, that means cable television. You know, you're watching a show. That's when it's on. It's live. When it's not live, you can't watch it anymore. Participating network can push a jump ad overlay that can link out to something like its own app, uh, showing a watch now button in hopes of offering a more seamless experience. For example, many of us are familiar with the fact that uh, a lot of cable networks now have their own streaming services and would very much like people to subscribe to those streaming services or at least know about them. Fox is the first to test this particular one. At the end of the premiere episode of its new comedy, Welcome to Flatch, an overlay comes up that says, you can watch the first seven episodes of the season on the Fox Now app. Exactly what I was talking about. This looks like a standard network banner, but you can select it with a Vizio remote and launch the app. So it's not just a banner, it's something clickable. Vizio also began working with other content providers and brands on a variety of integrations. So one would think Fox would only be one of the networks that Vizio is working with. Vizio also uses software called Inscape ACR, which recognizes when a program is on air and can then serve the particular banner in real time that is relevant to your interests. So it hopes. So everybody's reaction, in, including Callum Booth uh, at the Next Web, uh, and 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 love Callum Booth, uh, BioCow even in, in our chat room has this kind of reaction: is I don't want ads to be served by my TV over the television I'm already viewing. There are already enough ads. Uh, this is horrible. Uh, that I, I'm paraphrasing. These are not the exact words of, of BioCow or Callum Booth, but but that seems to be the reaction. I look at this and I think, you know. They already put up banners at the end of a show saying, uh, get more of these episodes streaming in our TV everywhere app, Fox Now. Why not make them clickable? What What is the problem with that? I don't know. Um, I actually, I don't watch a lot of live television. Um, I, I, I don't have a cable subscription. I use YouTube TV, which is very cable-like. Um, but if I were to... I know exactly what the scenario is here, where I, I kind of go like, eh, maybe I'll watch the show. I don't, maybe I don't know who's in it or, oh, I like it. Oh, okay. May, you know, is there an option for me to, you know, just kind of binge the rest of it? Not necessarily right that second, but we're all getting used to the idea of binging, something that we like a lot. I like the idea of that. I don't, I don't really have a huge issue with this, uh, but I also don't watch a lot of tech. TV because I don't like to be targeted. I don't like commercials. I don't like any of that stuff. So, you know, I kind of figure out other solutions that I, that I pay for, but this would also be something that you would pay for. Like the Fox integration is not just like, ah, oh, it's free because Vizio and Fox made this deal. It's like, no, I mean, you're still, this is something. Well, the Fox Now app, just to be clear, the Fox Now app works with your cable subscription. So if, if you're in our scenario watching cable, you already have access to it. So this sure. is just making it easy to get over there. Exactly. Exactly. But, uh, you know, th okay, that's one example of something that 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 wouldn't uh, hit your pocketbook, but um, a lot of other streaming services are not the same way. It just depends on where the show lives. I don't know. I this does not bother me that much. And all maybe the networks have their own I'm... TV everywhere apps that you don't have to pay any extra for. If you're a cable subscriber, I think people are most upset at, about like, this is an ad, uh, and, and upset about it being abused in the future. Not, not necessarily even this implementation, but now they're just going to be start putting banner ads that are unrelated to what I'm watching. And, Maybe Vizio does that, and if they do that, then I'll be upset with them too. But I kind of prefer to wait until they do something wrong to punish them for it. And so far, this this test doesn't seem bad. In fact, even having a clickable area in an ad, I don't think would be horrible if it's, in fact, motivated part of the ad and useful. Uh, I, there, there's a good way to do it and a bad way to do it. And so far, I don't see any evidence that they're doing it the bad way. I just don't really think of this as an ad. If it's an ad for the show that you're watching and mm -hmm. you've watched it for long enough, you know, that, that the, you know, algorithm understands like probably like this and you might want to see more. 
it doesn't feel as invasive to me as it would for, you know, like a toothpaste ad or something that, you know, was some overlay over a show that I had recently I think, discovered and I yeah. would like. I think that's what everybody's imagining is I'm going to be watching Game of Thrones or, or House of the Dragon and they're going to throw a toothpaste banner over it and it's going to take away part of the scene. That's not what they're doing. I'm, right. I'm, not, I'm not saying they couldn't do that with this, but so far it's not what they're doing. And what they're doing seems no different than what you already have, which is a little banner that says like, hey, watch the Grammys on Sunday. And now you could make that click here to set your DVR. Like, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know. Doesn't seem bad yet. I'm not saying it will never go bad, but doesn't seem bad yet. Uh, folks, if you want to tell me why I'm wrong and it is horrible and bad, uh, or preferably that I'm right and uh, and everyone else is overreacting, uh, either one of those conversations can happen in our Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Cloning. Remember Dolly the Sheep uh, back in 1997? Uh, South Korea produced the first cloned dog in 2005. And the BBC has a story about how cloning of pets, cats, dogs, horses, and otherwise, is becoming more common. Uh, they give us an example in this BBC story. New York police officer John Mendola, using a Texas company called Viagen, uh, took a tissue sample uh, before his dog Princess passed away from cancer. And then two clones were born to a surrogate mother. Mandola named them Princess Ariel and Princess Jasmine, which I find adorable. Uh, Viagen opened in 1998. It's been around for a while, but it originally focused on high-value livestock cloning before opening cloning of pets in 2015. It charges $85,000 to clone a horse, $50,000 to clone a dog, and $30,000 for a cat. Barbara Streisand has taken advantage of Viagen services to clone her dog, Samantha. And Viagen says 90% of its clients opt to have their pet cells preserved for $1,600 to possibly clone at a later date. So they're making a lot of money just on people reserving the option, not necessarily doing it. The cloning process is the same as it has been since Dolly the Sheep was first cloned. Uh, genetic material is removed from a donor egg. The cell nucleus of the animal you want to clone is then injected in that egg, and the egg is grown into an embryo in the lab, then implanted in a surrogate mother. The tissue from the animal you want cloned can be frozen and stored almost indefinitely, so that's why so many people are willing to put the $1,600 down on the off chance that they have the tens of thousands later. Viagen claims the animals are identical twins. Some studies, however, indicate that cloned animals might have more health issues. Uh, the most significant of these being premature aging. Adult cells have these shorter tips called telomeres. They get shorter every time your cell divides. And clones, starting from adult cells, may have shorter telomeres and therefore age faster. Uh, cloned animals have been observed to have shorter lifespans than expected. Another criticism is that not most cloned embryos don't come to term, uh, which is stressful on surrogate mothers. So for every two princesses you get, you, you might have had to have 20 surrogate mothers uh, get pregnant and a bunch of them not actually bring the baby or the pet baby to term. Uh, then there's the more general concern that so many pets already go unwanted in shelters. Uh, and that's the same objection to breeding in that case, which is why create new animals when there's so many waiting for a home as it is. Uh, obviously, Sarah and I, big pet owners, we both have dogs uh, and Sarah has cats. Uh, uh, what do you think of this, Sarah? Well, I've got some problems with it. Um, uh, the idea of cloning a pet that you love very much um, and you've got the money because this is cost prohibitive mm -hmm. to almost everybody. But if you've got the money, I can see why you would go this route. And, you know, I don't want to bag on this because I know, uh, you know, how loving your pet is. And, you know, if I could clone Otis, I, I would. But I feel like in order to do that, if we got to that point, not only do I have to come up with $50,000 for a dog, uh, quite a bit more if it was a horse, a little bit less if it was a cat, but that's a lot of money. I mean, who, who's got that kind of money? And also, it's not uh, necessarily guaranteed that the lifespan is going to be the same. It's also, you know, a genetic replica does not mean that it's going to be the same animal that you loved and you miss. Um, and this could also happen before the animal died. Uh, but that's, you know, that's a whole, you know, talk to any twin. It's like, I mean, it's not the same, per it's not a carbon copy. It can be, can look like a carbon copy, but it's not a carbon copy. 
and I'm not even talking about like science fiction movies here. It's just, that's just the reality. But what I'm, what uh, upsets me most about this is when humans, because of our scientific advancements, um, have been able to have more options as far as procreating, you know, you know, IVF and surrogates, and there's a whole, you know, industry involved in that. And I, don't pretend to know firsthand how that all works, but I have a pretty loose understanding because I know a lot of humans who have been through this. Everybody is kind of, you know, you know, there's money being transferred, people are on board. It's not the same with surrogate animals. And I don't like the sound of that at all. Um, and, when, and when you say it's not the same, you're saying the animals may not be being treated as well as the humans? Well, and they also can't get, you know, it's not like the surrogate dog is getting, you know, a fat wad of cash for like right. being part of this process. It's like, no, that's something that's being controlled by humans somewhere. I don't, I, I don't even know really where, where that is, but yeah, that's, that, that is very stressful physically on any mother. So, you know, you know, that alone is like, yeah, I don't know guys, I, you know, sure. Prove me wrong, but it doesn't seem ethical to me. Yeah, let let's pretend just just for the sake of argument that that all the shelters emptied, all the dogs got adopted. Uh, let's pretend that uh, they they came up with a surrogate program where where there was a better eff efficacy rate, and the surrogate mothers only had to uh, to give birth to to one uh, puppy, uh, and then they moved on, and they were well taken care of. Uh, and there were no downside. Would I like if we got rid of all the ethical problems with it, would I still do it? And the fact of the matter is, man, as much as I'd love to have Django the dog back, it wouldn't be Django the dog. It would look a lot like her. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. And and it would probably have some of the same mannerisms, but it depends on who you ask. The, they estimate like 25 percent of the personality of a pet comes from whatever they experience growing up. And certainly they'll experience yeah. some of the same things being around you, but you aren't the same person you were 10 years ago. So you're not going to do all the same things. It's going to be a different dog. Now, I think there's still an argument for like, yeah, but even if I could get Django the dog's sister, that'd be kind of cool. And that's where it goes back to like, okay, but we need to figure out a lot of the other ethical sides of this and bring the cost way down, like you were saying before I'd want to consider it. But but to me, that's, that's the first blocker is like, I, I don't know that I want this. And when there's a perfectly great dog waiting in a shelter for me, I think I'd rather go that way to start with. Yeah, I'm I'm with you 100% on that one. And I really don't I I I do not want to bag on the idea of like if I could clone my, you know, my lovable, most wonderful pup pup, you know, for for all eternity. I I would. But I don't feel like our options right now are are sufficient enough for for me to make it happen even if i had the money which i do not but even if i did i don't i don't i don't i don't think we're there yet agreed well, the UK's Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, Richie Sunak, announced that the Royal Mint will issue an official NFT sometime this summer. You might say, "What? What what would that be?" Economic Secretary John Glenn said that the token would be a symbol of a forward-looking approach that supports crypto technology and is planning legislation that would introduce stable coins into the UK's payment infrastructure, would also consider legal statuses for decentralized autonomous organizations, also known as DAOs, and also hopes to remove disincentives to investment funds that also include crypto. The Financial Conduct Authority is planning the first in a series of policy crypto sprints this May. Just kind of trying it out. And the government is forming a crypto asset engagement group that includes representatives from the FCA, Bank of England, and also a variety of businesses. Yeah, roll your eyes all you want. You may be justified in that, but this is how you learn. And so if you want the government to learn how this stuff works, you might want them to try one, right? And uh, I didn't say anything yeah. about central bank digital currencies in here, but my guess is this is preparing the groundwork and and doing some learning for that. And I think that's not necessarily as bad as you might think. Yeah, when I um, when I read the story initially from Engadget this morning, it was sort of like, hold on to your butts, everybody. Here we go. And I think that folks who are not involved with cryptocurrency and specifically NFTs. Uh, have gotten very used to saying, oh, you know, 
what what who is this good for well it's good for a lot of people it depends on what you want to transfer and you know your your value on ownership and and how you see that going in the future and i actually think this is pretty forward facing yeah and it's it's not like a big money generating plan it it if you read read it closely it's it's a test and on before before you criticize a government for for testing something that way uh Consider whether you also criticize them for not knowing things, for being dumb, for for not understanding technology. Uh, I, I feel like there's probably a lot of problems with this because I haven't looked at it that closely, to be honest. But I'm not going to condemning condemn them just for the idea of trying. Sure. Well, we will also not condemn new bosses. In fact, we will celebrate them with great fanfare. We got new, brand new bosses over the weekend. Nathaniel, Nigel, Tim, Min, and Chandra all just started backing us on Patreon. This really made our Monday. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Nathaniel. Thanks, Nigel. Nigel, rather. Thanks, Tim. And thanks, Nim and Chandra. Yeah, keep uh, keep us going into April. Keep us going strong. We're up one patron over last month. We want to keep we, that going. We are. Yeah, March was kind of, you know, it was, it was a little bit of a down month. Yeah, so we're on the up and up. We and it, we'd love to keep that trajectory going. Uh, reminder, folks, there's a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet available at patreon.com slash DTNS. Uh, we roll right into that after this show. But just a reminder that DTNS is live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we are back doing it all again tomorrow with Lamar Wilson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>